So as far as they're concerned, they may need to move on this spectrum, and I just use terms like policy and agents, because I, as the university agent in this room, have a responsibility to uphold university policy on some level, right? We talk about, talk about it, and I said, well, when you get across to here, and I ask the question, and I'm gonna ask it here in the classroom, what kind of wealth can I use to enforce policy here in this classroom? Think about it for a minute. How would you define, like, what, we've spoken about government. I can tell you that there are rules, right? We all know that there are rules about it. There's the national rule, and then there's the university rule and policy. There's also norms that are associated with this concept and what it means for us, right? But I'm, I'm curious, because, and this one's easy, called security. What would you put here? Think about it for a minute. Seriously, think about it, and then I want to hear your answers, and I'm going to turn off my buzzer so that it doesn't buzz on us. You're going to work. Go ahead. Who's got something for me? Extra points. <laughs> I mean, that's a positive sense. That's a positive sense. Yeah, like I could be like, hey, anyone who wears a mask, I'll give you extra credit. Is there an opposite version of that, though? Yeah. Uh, if you, and also, if, if, if you do not wear a mask, that will ruin your relationship. And, uh, you know, if, if it goes that far as a lecturer asks you to put on a mask, and you refuse, refuse, you have to ruin your relationship as a lecturer, and it might impact your grade. Right, so there's obviously the greed. Now, here's the thing. We look at wealth as what I can do with my wealth, right, as a manifestation of power. But wealth in and of itself is really reward possibilities. I can reward another person using my wealth. My wealth of knowledge, my self-worth, my feeling of like, here's what I can bring to the table, my own energy, my own whatever. So wealth is not just about, well, what money or natural resources can I bring to the table to manifest this, but this is about reward possibilities. How can I reward someone who's doing the job that I want done, that's doing the things that I need to have done? So I want you to consider this spectrum as much more nuanced than what I'm giving it to you here as. There's a lot of ways that wealth comes into play, for instance, or norms come into play that we're not going to touch on. We're not going to have the ability to touch on in the class or online, but if you think about it for a moment or two, you go, oh man, that's manifestation as well. That's manifestation as as, as norms and, and those are rules, and, oh, and you'll start seeing it. Yeah? I just wanted to add something in, in, in business. Yeah. Uh, about the specific thing. About, yeah. Um, so I, I, I've, I've been watching this lecture, and apparently because they have discovered recent research, that it, and it works particularly well with uh, gener millennials and Generation Z, Z, is that uh, one of the things how to motivate people to stay loyal to your company is apparently to feed them, like right. So Google has open restaurants and all these other places. At Facebook, you can walk in and there's like every thirty steps you can buy something, you can get something to eat, it costs you nothing, right? Yeah. Um, and it's thirty steps because Disney decided like ate a hot dog and figured out it takes thirty steps to finish a hot dog and then you can throw it away. But like, there's a reason why they do that. Part of the reason why is because they are using this as a means to engage their followers so that the follower will feel like they have worth, like they have worth to the company. And it's worth the company's while to spend this money on the food for them. And it's worth the company's while to do it because it keeps them happy. And there's a lot that goes into it. The, the idea of wealth very much also comes from an understanding of, well, what's important to that person? Right? What's important to you? What's important to you? Because I could talk wealth in terms of money, and if you're like, if there's no food, I need to show it up. Right? Or the opposite, you know. Look, free food all you want, but the paycheck is bumptious. Is it worth it? And so you're gonna go through a process of trying to understand what I like what am I presenting as, as my wealth, the thing that I can give. But there's only one of the many, like money is only one of the many, many, many manifestation of wealth. That's what I'm trying to say. Wealth is not just money. It's not even just resources. It's things that I can do that will give you something. Right? If I have knowledge and you want it, then I can manifest that power. I can limit your knowledge and your ability to get that knowledge. Which is I can just ask you to leave the room. And you say, you're not going to wear a mask. I can. See you later. Bye. Right? I'm going to limit your capacity to get what I know. That's a reward capacity, but it's a negative sense of it. So what I want you to understand is that there's nuance here. Like rules, there's written rules and there's unwritten rules, right? But they're rules. 
Then there are norms. Norms are slightly different. It's just sort of like how everyone is expected to behave, and this is sort of our culture. This is sort of how we do things. But they're not rules. There's no nobody's going to call you out for breaking these, except for the fact that you're maybe doing a faux pas, right? Which is a very different way of looking at this concept than looking at it as strict wealth or strict force. Because force also, force doesn't necessarily mean beating someone over the head, right? I think I can threaten force. It, it, that in and of itself becomes part of this manifestation process. The potential of it. the potential for force, right? So. We see these as things that are, when they are manifest, we feel them, like, okay, when there's war, when there's rioting, when there's conflict, we feel it, right? But you can also feel the precursor to it. You can feel when someone's moving across from norms, you know, wealth, into manifestation as force. They start to get angrier than the way they express themselves. Even as, like, states, countries, you see how they're responding to something. It, it, does this make sense? And it's nuanced, it's so nuanced. Does everyone understand what I'm just saying? Sweet. And we spoke about we spoke about the affect of gravity, so I need to continue with that. And we spoke about numbers. So who has power? And the answer is basically well, who has time? Because if power is about an idea and the desire to manifest that idea, then it depends on your will and your desire to manifest that idea, and that gives you power. How much power? Well, that's a different question. It's a totally different question than do you have power? How much power you have depends on who you know, who you can influence, how broad a network you can expand that out to, how you choose, what channels you choose to use. And that's already a question of strategy. It's already a question of, well, how do we get from here to there? How do I get what I want, given what I've got? So we defined strategy last week. We spoke about it. We spoke about the fact that there is a unity to strategy across time and space. It seems like no matter where we're going, go to ancient Greece and ancient China and modern day technologies and business and families, and there's this unity to strategy that sort of goes along with everyone. And it's a question of what it means. And we spoke about strategic hierarchy and how we focus it, right? And we said every level of the hierarchy has a focus. And the strategic level's focus is intelligence gathering intelligence analysis, and the creating of ideal types. In an ideal world, if everything goes the way we would like, the way we plan, and I don't like that word because it tends to suggest, and I'll say it again and again, suggest this is no longer negotiable, no longer open to flexibility, which is wrong. You can use the word plan as long as you make clear to everybody, guys, this plan is for now until the world decides to intervene, right? Um, but the primary focus of the strategic level is intelligence gathering and analysis for understanding to create a knowledge base, to create a sense of here is what, where we are in the world. Here's reality as we know it. And that reality is going to be very important to you in the future because it's going to be part of how you choose to create vision, how you choose to move forward in the world. This is where we are, and that's where I want to be. That's where I want to go. How do I get there? What do I have to do to get there? So there are a lot of different systems that have been created that try and explain how do I get from, from here to there. One of them is design thinking. And if you watch the video on design thinking, you realize that the last of those three videos comes and says, wait a second, this is all well and good in theory, but in reality, it doesn't look so smooth. It's not that you go, okay, we're gonna go stage one, empathize, stage two, divine, ID, prioritize, test, we're done. Not quite. It's more like, okay, empathize. Who is this for? What do they need? What do they need? Right? So we go and we go and check out something like an empathy map. Now this is one of many different ways of doing this. This is the way that's used by design thinking, or it's one of the ways that's used. Right? And then you go, you go around and you say, okay, well, who are we empathizing with? Who's our customer? Or if you're talking militarily, who's our enemy? <laughs> or who's our ally, right? It's about figuring out who it is we're talking about. I mean, very specific. Old people who fall down in the shower because you're making something for them. And you want to find out as much as you can about them because they're your customer base. They're the people who are going to give you the information you need in order to know what they need to not fall down in the shower. 
right? So you're going to figure out who they are, and you're going to do what do you think that they need to do? What is the pain point? And this is a business term, but it's very relevant for the military as well. There's a point where something is blocking our ability to get from here to there. Okay? Those points in military terms are centers of gravity. There is something or somebody denying us the ability to move forward. How do I attack that thing? How do I get rid of it? Do I, how, how do I influence it so that it no longer makes my life difficult? It no longer gets in my way. It no longer frustrates me to no end that I can't do this thing that I want to do. Right? Now, in business, it can be simple stuff. Like, I don't know, somebody wanted to create a search engine that would give them more, more easy access to information. And then you get Google. And then Google becomes something else entirely, and we'll talk about that. But Netflix, if you think about it, they were all coming to answer some major issue that somebody had. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist anymore. And the fact that they adapted over time is wonderful because that's an essential skill set. But that's not the point. The point is, is something started them along a path to deal with some customer, some somebody. The military does this all the time. They will sit there and try and figure out everything they possibly can about their enemies and about their allies. Why? Because they want to know what is it those people want to do or need to do to get what they want done. And then they're going to say, okay, well, what is it that they're seeing? What is it that they're saying? What is it that, they're, they, you know, that they do on a day-to-day -day basis? What is it that they're hearing? In other words, what is the environment that, within which they are working? And what is their interest within that environment? What is it that they want to get done in that environment? Because if I can figure that out, I can either figure out how to work with them, or I can figure out how to stop them. Right? If I can figure out what you want to do in the world, And I understand the reality within which you believe, important word there, believe you are working, then I can empathize with you. I can see the world from your perspective. In other words, I can also figure out where your centers of gravity are. I can figure out what you think is important. What tools are you going to try and use in order to get the job done? And if I know that, then I can blow them up. Right? Give you an example from the military, okay? Sniper school. Back when I was in sniper school, we draw on the board and go, okay guys, here's the scenario. I'm gonna draw on the board and go, okay, here's the scenario. Okay, so here's the scenario, okay? You're over here on this hill and you're, you got your sniper shots, right? And over here, you've got Two mountains and a map. And this area has been blocked off because we bombed it. So there's very big boulders here. And on this end over here, there's a whole bunch of tanks that want to come through. They can't get over the boulders, so they bring in a huge tractor. Tractor. And this Jeep comes up, and the guy in the Jeep is a general who looks like he's got a nice big hat. Right. And you've got the, Jeep, the driver here. The question is, I'm a sniper, right? So I'm not taking out the tanks. Let's be honest, snipers don't shoot tanks. It doesn't work. I'm not taking out the entire uh, tractor. You can't blow up the tractor. I mean, if I have a barret, I might be able to shoot the engine of the tractor. So let's not say I have that. We'll say I have a, a you know, a 338, a Winchester. It's going to do its job fine. Who do I shoot? The general, the tank driver, the lead tank driver, or the driver of the tractor? Where's the center of gravity? Now think about what it is they want to do. They want to come through this pass. Where's the center of gravity? I can't call in air support, it's just me. Just be really clear, I'm making this as simple as possible. Because otherwise, yes, air support and all kinds of fun stuff in order to make this interesting. But if it's just me. The general? Why? Because they're following the general orders. Okay, and if he should get shot, who takes over? That's the question. Well, yeah, the XO, right? This is the next guy in charge, like there's a whole hierarchy here. So, so. Okay. Go tractor operator. Why do you go tractor operator? Because I got removed the 
that barrier. Okay. So you're saying. So you're saying what you're saying is, is that what you were going to say as well? Yeah. So what you're saying is this guy looks like an ideal target, but he's not the center of gravity. He might not even be an active variable in the process. He's just following like this is the most logical way. We're stuck here. Let's resolve it, right? But this guy, you shoot him. If you eliminate him from the picture, can they move the boulders? No. That's the center of gravity for that interaction. If I empathize with the other group, it's easier for me to recognize that. They want to come through. How do I stop them from doing that? Does that make sense? Because otherwise, the ideal target is a general. It's got more stars. It's worth more for me to get rid of him. His influence overall is much greater. Right? His ability to meet him hundreds of things at a time. But if they can't get through the past, it doesn't matter. Without that understanding, without understanding what it is they wanted to do, as a sniper, it can be very dangerous because you will make the wrong choice. The same thing is true in business. If you think about a business and you go, okay, what's that business trying to do and where are their competitors? I mean, yes, we're going to talk about infinite games and, and finite games and stuff like that because that's part of this. But at the end of the day, you want to look at what their centers of gravity are. Can I hire away someone who's doing the job that they want done for, in order to slow them down? People do that all the time. Businesses will offer their competitors, you know, centers of gravity, mucho dollar in order for them to come over to, to work for me. In fact, a lot of contracts now deny them the ability to do that. A lot of people are being, when they, when they sign on, if, they're, if they are known to be a center of gravity, this is a, someone who, because of their knowledge, because of their, their skill set, whatever it is, we don't, if we lose them, we don't want them going to our competitors, there's a cooling off period where if you leave our company, whether you're fired or you choose to leave of your own accord, there's a six month cooling off period before you can go work for a competitor. And you have to get our approval to do that. Why are they doing that? Because they're worried about this. Does that make sense? They're worried about it, so they are actually trying to maneuver in, in, that, same, in that same sense. They're trying to make sure that center of gravity doesn't come into play. That it can't be attacked. It makes it not a worthwhile endeavor to engage. But you have to be able to see what the other person wants to be able to know to do that. Because then, what are you going to offer everybody? You know, I'm offering all of you a million dollars. Congratulations! No, you want to be specific because you want to know that when you start to maneuver in this way, you're hitting the right spot. Now, let me back up. Back up. Once we've empathized, once I know what it is you want to do, now I can start defining the problem. I can start really understanding, well, what is the nature of the issue that I'm facing here? How can I resolve it? What is the best way for me to get from here to there? And then I'm going to ideate on this. I'm going to take this whole thing and I'm going to go, okay, well, I can do this, and I can do that, and I can do this, and I can do that. And all these different ideas are going to pop up, and I'm going to say, okay, here are the best options out of the different concepts that I've come up with, let's prototype and test and test and then you go back and you do this again and you do it again and you do it again until you get a, a, a product, right? Now, here's the thing. Same thing works if you're talking about an idea that you want to have manifest. You go and you talk to your friend about it and you go, yo, what about this idea? And they go, you're an idiot! And then you go and talk to your friend again and you're like, listen, I revised it a little bit. What do you think about this? And it's like, right, so that's not so bad. You're doing the same thing. Does that make sense? And what are you doing? You're, empath you're going literally empathize, figure out what it is, okay, define, da, 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 uh, test it, talk about it again. Test it, it can just be a talk. It doesn't even need to be the actual, like your prototype might be a conceptual prototype. Show them a picture of it. What do you think about this? Is this closer to what you want? Is this closer to what we're thinking about? We haven't even gotten into actually manufacturing anything yet. Does that all make sense what I just said? Yeah, sweet. So here's the thing, there are, a lot of these different models. And a lot of them, a lot of them, choose five steps. They're all like, strategy is a, you know, power of creative process is a five step process. Five steps. Uh, okay, so the SEF says it's six steps, but one of those steps is kind of clunky and wonky, so it's really five steps. <laughs> um, okay, but five steps. So here's the five step model according to, according to Lackley and Martin, right? And they go, well, what is your winning aspiration? What is it that you want to do? What, what's your idea, right? What's that thing you want to be working towards? Where will we play? What's your theater of operation? 
Is it in high tech? And if so, in what field in high tech? Right? Is it on the battlefield? What part of the battlefield? Which battlefield? What aspect of that battlefield? Are we talking cyber? Are we talking about on the actual dirt, you know, feet, you know, boots on the ground? Are we talking about Air Force and Navy? What are we talking about? Right? How are you going to win in this interaction? What is it that you are going to do to come out on top? Now, if you're, win if you're playing a game that is finite, then there are rules that tell you when you've won and when you haven't won. But if you're playing an infinite game, which is, let's just make sure we all come out of this alive, then it's very different. And it depends, because sometimes, some people are just trying to live, and other people are just trying to win. There's a whole video on that you guys are gonna watch soon, actually. Um, what capabilities have to be in place, and what management systems are in place? So if you think about it, it's idea, theater, operations, tactical capabilities, actual you know, resource that you're bringing to play, boom, 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 stuff around. And here's how we manage our actual interactions and relations. The skills that, you're going to come, that are going to come into play, or the, the systems that you're going to put into play, so that when someone comes in and goes, I'm a customer, you go, cha-ching, here's how we take your money. Okay? Now here's the thing. They actually suggest, and what's cool about this is that they suggest that the model isn't one level, it's not level, 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 it's that at every single level of an organization, you're going to run through this whole five-stage process. They are saying this is the creative process. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is not the levels, this is the creative process, and you are actually going to engage this process, according to them, every single level is going to have to do this. The, the, the corporate level, right? The strategic level is going to have to do this. This, the individual business level is going to have to do this. All, all are going to go through the same process. And what they're all going to do is focus differently. The focus will be slightly different. So at this level, right, the focus will probably be over here more than it will be down here. The weight will be different, right? You get here, it's going to be more here. And then as you get down here, it's going to be closer here. But it's still requires alignment, everything has to be sort of similar in these middle ones. Because if, if your how to win is so significantly different from my how to win, no problem. We're in the same organization. We're not on the same page about what we're supposed to, like how we're supposed to be doing this. We're not translating the idea effectively through all levels. Did that make sense what I just said? Sweet. All right. This is another system. This one comes in and says, wait a second, there's two five-stage processes. First five-stage process, and then a second five-stage process. The first one is about ideation. It's about this planning and preparing and getting the world ready for you to then act within it, right? So the process, you, you're gonna create a team, and those, that team is now going to start thinking about, oh, well, who's our customers? Who are the people that you have to deal with? We're going to go in depth on that. We're going to delineate all the different parts of the canvas. There's a thing up about this later also. Um, you can delineate all the different parts of the canvas. More on that later. You're going to expand. You're going to describe the potential for each of the different elements on the canvas. What is it you can do with all the different elements of strategy that this specific theory gives you? What is it that's real for you? What is it you need to know? You can deal with like, what are the most important criteria for prioritizing this idea? What do I have to do? What do I, what do I think I have to do in order to get this done? So what do I think I have to do? So what am I actually doing? It's given this moment of contemplation, well, what, what do I have to do to get this done? I, I, I know what they want. I, I know what they need. I know how to do it. I, I understand how each of the different elements, whichever element system you're going to use, come into play in order for us to understand where to go. But what am I going to do? And then you make a decision. And then once you made that decision, you go through an actualization process. The actualization process starts here. You start mobilizing. You say, okay, I'm se I've set the stage. I know what I'm going to do. I've, I've thought it through. I had this plan set up. I've got all the elements. I know where all those elements are. I know how they come into play. I understand what I need to do. Gather as much intelligence as I need to move forward. Start designing, start implementing, go through the process, feedback, execution, feedback, execution, implementation, do it again, do it again, do it again, and hope that it comes out good. And it's a process that you go through over and over and over again until success, or the decision to leave the board. You have a question?
Okay. Did that make sense, everyone? Do you see how it's sort of similar? Like, they're sort of describing the same thing, they're just using slightly different terminology, or they're breaking up the pattern a little bit in between each one of them. You see it? Yet another one, same thing. Five stages, get started. Internal debate, searching for inspiration, right? They're literally searching for inspiration, that's what they're saying. Where is it that we are not playing that we need to be playing? Who do we need to be, like, which customers are, do, are, do we not have in our net that we want to start bringing into our net? Who are the enemies that we haven't even thought about yet that we need to start dealing with? The brainstorm and the external influences that might inspire you. Well, they're doing that, and they're doing that, and Iran is doing that. Okay, now what do we do, right? And you concentrate on the other. For this, for this purpose, it's the customer, but the other doesn't have to be the customer. The other can be your enemy, it can be your allies, if you're talking in the military or in the diplomatic realms. It can be your economic partners. Like, there's a lot of different places. It can be your lawyers, right? So you have to realize, concentrate on the others. Who are the others that are involved? How are they involved? What is it that they're bringing to the table? Or what is it they're worried about? That they need your help with, that they need to... Does it make sense what I'm saying? So, and then you, where are we now? I'm setting, my, I'm setting myself up. Okay, I've done all my, my research. This is my knowledge base. This is what I know to be true. Now, how true is that? Mm, is it absolute? It's an actual question. Your your sense of reality, is it absolutely true? Not necessarily. No. Yes. The, uh, yes, no, maybe. I'm not sure. It depends from person to person, I guess. Okay, I'm going to ask a very specific question. While we all think that our reality is absolute, this is my reality, have you ever been surprised by something? Yeah, of course. Okay, so what happens when that happens? Is well, your does your reality sort of change like that? Okay, so something we're going to talk about when we talk about surprise is that what we know now is not necessarily truth. It's not it's not an absolute, and so we need to make, if we want to think strategically, we have to accept that our reality and what we pers like our mindset and the reality may not be exactly as aligned as we think they are. Yeah. I thought maybe you were also referring to like an emotional or bias kind of mindset. We're gonna get into bias in a minute. Um, yeah, you're 100% here. You're right. Just not that wasn't what I meant. But yes, okay, so. right. So we gather intelligence about the present situation. We understand the market constitution. We understand where things are, things are being focused, where the focuses are, and everything else. We try to gather as much as we can create a knowledge base, and then we take that knowledge base. We go, okay, now what can I do with it? Where, where can I? How far can I take this? Right. Move it on. And how do I get there? And then you start moving. You make your move. And you start actually engaging, trying to do whatever you want to do. Um, and yet another one is, well, first get the facts. <laughs> Figure out what those facts tell us. What do you find out? What are the object objective results of the analysis of these facts? What does the actual data tell you? Now that could be the interviews. You could have gone and interviewed 100 people who are you know, old people who reported that they've fallen in the shower and you've got, gotten as much data from them as you possibly can. It could be, you know, a single individual. I was at a really cool uh, event the other day on Thursday. I was at Makers for Heroes. Makers for Heroes is an event held by Restart that um, creates um, basically prototypes of different mechanisms that will help disabled IDF veterans deal with the challenges that they're having. And what do they do? They literally have to go through this process of look at all the facts about that person, find out as much as they possibly can. And then they did it for one of these guys who has PTSD and they created a watch. They were gonna create a watch. They bought a watch off the market and they created a program that will, he can report how he's feeling at any, any, any moment in time. And when he starts having an attack, it automatically triggers a whole bunch of responses on his phone for, hey, you know, you need to take your pill. Hey, you should watch this video, which will help you calm down. But they went through and collected six months of data, and then they had to create as objective a set of that data as they could to understand its meaning for this guy. Does that make sense? What I just said, in order to be able to create, to come to conclusions, come to recommendations about how best to implement, given the given the data, and then they were able to implement a prototype. But first, they had to do all that process of strategizing. They had to actually gather all the information. It took them literally six months of just data collection and analysis. So they were in the strategic phase for a long time, right? 
They were dealing with the strategic stage of this, of just gathering that information, getting as much of it as they can, figuring out what it means for a very long time. Once they did that, and they had conclusions, they could say, hey, this is what we know. It was easy for them to start coming up with recommendations about, okay, when this happens, here's what we want to do. When this happens, here's what we want to do. When this happens, here's what we want to do as a result. Did that make sense what I just said? Cool. Another way to look at it is the Lightner variety, which is we start with grand strategy, strategy, you know, the operative, the tactical, the technically tactical, but instead of looking at them as levels, we look at them as stages in the process. Grand strategy is when we're open to inspiration. We're looking at all the different ideas that are out there. We're going, well, what's your pain points? What's the issues that are dealing? I don't care about that. Okay, what's in our city? Oh, that I might want to try and deal with. That bothers me personally, or I don't like that it bothers you. So I want to help you with it, right? And then I'm going to go, okay, well, given that, what do I do with it? What do I need to learn? I'm going to start learning as much as I possibly can about it. I'm going to take the time and the energy to analyze as much of that information as I possibly can. So that I can start figuring out, well, given that, what kind of resources do I need to come bring to the table in order to get this done, right? Which is already in the operative stage. We're starting like, okay, what are the resources? What time and energy do we need to actually get involved here in order to see things come to conclusion? What do I have to do in terms of what am I allowed to do? Am I allowed to go kill somebody in order to get this done? Or is this the kind of situation where, you know, murder is not allowed, which is generally the case. Right? You have to, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, what is it that need, and what is permitted? Like, if you're not okay with me having a huge carbon footprint creating the thing you want me to make, then that's something I need to keep in mind when I decide how I'm going to do this. What are the different resources I'm going to, resources I'm going to use? And what are the different parts of my doctrine or your doctrine that are going to influence what I see is acceptable behavior, right? Make sense? After that is when we start maneuvering. Okay, we know what resources we're putting towards this. We're gonna start maneuvering these resources. We're gonna start maneuvering those resources. These are the limitations on action that I expect from this group. Here's the acceptable actions that I accept from that group. Bada, 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 bada. They each are working towards specific goals. And as this is happening, or as I'm doing all these things, like if I'm making Shabbos dinner, if I'm making Friday night meal, right? I have to do the entire process, and then I have to do the cooking. And I better have the skills to be able to make all the different dishes I want to make, because if not, I might need to call a friend and go, or my wife, and be like, honey, can you please make this? Because when I try and bake, I burn the stove. I don't bake in my house. I am my cook. But baking is beyond me, for instance. So I don't have that skill set. I'm not good at it. So I rely on an ally in order to get that part of the skill set done in order to have this process complete. But I'm good at shopping. No, I hate shopping. I'm great at it. My hands are like little missiles. Ooh, get that, get that, get this. And if you think about it, like that's what she did. She sent me out as an F-16 into, the, into there. And I'm going to plan my flight path really well because I do not want to get lost in the candy aisle, which I will. It's, an, it's, a, it's a chasm of epic proportions, right? And I'm going to hit all these things that she's giving me on a list. You have to hit this target, that target. Put all these things in the thing. Or I made myself a list, get it, and go home. What's the difference? I'm not an F-16, but I can do it with an F-16 if I'm a general. And I feel like someone in Syria is about to do something problematic. Yeah. Or maybe you can try, I just thought, thought about it, maybe you can try something completely innovative and different. Like what? Uh, well, if you're a general, you can send instead of an F-16 drone, and you will not be risking people. Right, and so. if you are a person going to shop, to, 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 to grocery shopping, you can order online. Right. So there's all different things I can do. Like, my wife wouldn't order online, are you kidding? She hates ordering online just as much as she does going to the store. <laughs> like, but I know that. So tactically, she'll give me that responsibility. The goal of shopping, to get that, to the objective, shopping for Shabbat, that, that's not one that she's gonna touch. It's my job, right? But if I know that, then I'm gonna maneuver, I'm gonna maneuver tactically to include that in my schedule whether I'm doing it online or not, right? Same thing with the general. He's gonna choose based on his resources. Is it worth it for me to send humans? Is it worth it for me to just send a drone? Depends. Like, do we wanna lose that drone in in Syria? Depends on how advanced technology we're talking about, whether it's worth the use of it for the purposes that we're talking about. There are certain targets, 
specific centers of gravity where you might go, you know what, it's worth losing the secrecy of this technology in order to hit that center of gravity because it is so influential on our relationship, on our process, on where we want to go in the future and how where I want to take it. Did that make a sense for everybody? Cool. Yeah. These, are, these are interdependent, right? So what happens is, is just like they said in, um, in the video about design thinking, you might be getting all the way down to here and suddenly hit a pain point that requires you to come back here and go, I need more resources. I need more time. Story from the army. It's a known fact that when you are on a long march, at some point you will get lost and you suddenly find yourself on the walkie talkie going, I need more time. We're not going to get there in time. We need more time. And they'll, they will hopefully say to you, you know, okay, we heard you. You can have an extra 15 minutes. And if they don't, you go, and you run as fast as you possibly can. But that request for more time is simply a maneuver on the part of someone who's further along in the process or someone who represents the process outward, looking inwardly and saying, hey, what we delineated as acceptable amount of resource for this operation isn't enough. I need more time to do this. Honey, they don't have this thing that you want in the store here. Am I going to another store or can I come home, please? <laughs> right? <laughs> No, you have to buy it. My parents are coming and they love it. Okay, fine. <laughs> and now you've added, did you, did you see the relationship? It, it, you literally went back a stage to consider, well, how important is this resource to success? And now we'll keep moving, right? And then it's gonna change your timeline. It's gonna change your timeline. It's gonna change how you act. It might even change how much you're willing to spend. Companies do this all the time. Where they, they're going through something and then someone throws an idea at them and they go, oh, let, let's, move back a little bit for a second and reconsider how we're going to engage with that. Because I didn't expect that kind of reaction. I didn't expect that. They, very often they'll beta test something, right? And when you're beta testing, when you get in, if you're part of a beta test, you get to see all the bugs. They're literally asking you to play with their toy to see the bugs that they've got. And then all of a sudden someone throws them a bug and they go, ah. Uh, this is so out of the realm of anything we expected, what do I do? And they have to go back in the process and reconsider their objectives and whether they want to throw more resources at resolving that objective. Does that make sense? Yeah. People often don't want to be a part of beta testing in my experience. Why not? Uh, well, because, uh, you know, especially if you are a business, you know, as they're coming to you to get a specific product and they want it to work and they know that if it's a better product, it might not work quite as well as a finished thing. Right, so why should I use something which isn't fully, like, fully, like, working? Why, why am I wasting my time? Exactly. Right? And so, there are people, there's actually um, really interesting research which says about 2.5% of the population, they love being beta testers. They will dive into, like, new, new, something, a new Apple's coming out, they're on it. You know, a new, a new iPhone, a new I, I don't know what is coming out, they're on it. A new Windows 11 just came out, 2.5% of the population went, me. And the rest of us went, mm, maybe soon. And then there's another group of us that went, mm, not for a while. <laughs> I want to see how well this works before I start messing with my machine. Right? And then there's the people who are latecomers, they're like, you will have to drag me into the modern era. I still use a pen and pencil. Leave me alone. <laughs> right? And so you're right, there's, there's, you know that there are certain groups that you can get, but it also depends. Because there are certain fields which will get more interaction and there are certain fields which won't. And people want to see what they're going to get out of it. So like for instance, NFTs right now, non-fungible tokens, are a really big thing for gaming. But it's just starting out. So people who are willing to beta test, they might be getting, you know, foot in the door, camels snout under the tent, whatever you want to call it, to be able to have access to some pretty rare Bitcoin beast or some other altcoin beast system, but they're completely being beta tested to see is this worthwhile? Are people interested? How interested? How much can we get them to gamify this? And like we're talking real gamifying, like there's a game out there right now where you can play, basically it's like playing Pokemon except it's not Pokemon, it's whatever system they set up. Mm. It's really cool. But then you can win non-fungible tokens, which are worth Bitcoins. 
what? <laughs> what? So they're looking to make this a market, but it's not a market yet. It's a, it's a developing market. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So they're playing here in a creative process, but they're, they're, they know they're gonna have to go back at some point and come up with more resources, really rare things and these kinds of things and those, right? Because that's how you make money. Does this make sense what I said? This process seems to be the, I, I don't want to call it the core process, but like every time I've done research into different processes, every time I've looked at a different theory about this, it sort of follows this pattern. It might not be exactly this pattern. They might have moved one thing above in front of another. Sometimes strategy, or sometimes operative is before strategy in terms of how some people have set it up, in terms of where they're putting their focus. They'll say, you only start gathering intelligence after you have a sense of what your resources are and where you know what you believe is a good thing to do. Okay. It depends. But it seems like, seems like, they all have these five stages as a creative process. Does that make sense? Now, I'm, I'm very specifically using creative process or power process and not strategy. Because I don't think that this is the strategic process. I think this is longer, bigger than the strategic process. Does that make sense? I think it takes more, it's a more involved process, and I think it, it develops something much broader than what a strategic process is designed to do. A strategic process is supposed to get you from stage to stage to stage, for instance. Does that make sense? We'll talk about it too. So there is a common misconception, and I've said it before, and I want to focus on it for a minute, that we have this thing called strategy as plan. Now, yeah. Yeah, I can do that. Is that good? Is everyone okay with this, or are you going to fall asleep? No. I have that one on, is that okay or is it all or something? Is this okay like that? All right, sweet. All right, so JC Wiley defines strategies and plan of action. I've explained why I don't like this. I would like to know if anyone would like to argue the point with me. Does anyone want to say the strategy is a plan? And if so, please come in, please explain why. No, I should say is that perhaps plan or not plan, planning mm -hmm. is part of the strategy, but only one part of pretty crisis. Before you plan, you have to, you know, what we have just discussed, you have to gather your intelligence and you have to define what you have to do. Okay, so, yeah. I would say that plan, the, the plan is the final result of yeah, the strategizing process. process. Right, so you're saying you beat no. the last... <laughs> no, that's fine. No, no, that's good. Good, good, good. So does anyone else want to argue? That, like, does anyone want to argue against my argument that plan in and of itself is not strategy, even though plan of action is the definition of strategy if you look in a dictionary. Well, after what you have just learned, it makes sense. You don't have to agree with me. The point is I'm opening the door for you to say, I disagree because you know, you're allowed to do that. It makes sense. Okay, so far it makes sense? Good, that's why this slide is here. I wanna make sure we're all on the same page, that we understand strategy isn't plan. It's not that I'm planning and that's what I do when I strategize. Strategizing actually takes something much is something much deeper. It requires us to consider the possibility that any plan we make is wrong. Any plan we make might actually be the wrong set of potential maneuvers to get us from here to there. So then how do you resolve that? What do you do in order to not have a plan? Because everyone plans. Like If you think about it, when you strategize, at the end of the day, you go, okay, this is what we're going to do. Isn't that a plan? It might be a process, right? It might not be a plan, but fun functionally in our heads, it's something our neural cortex just sort of does. It goes, good, you have a plan, now go execute it. To the point where, they, for mice, we're gonna go into the world of mice for a minute, they've recently found that mice who have visited a place before, and then they're moved to another area in a maze, but they know how to get where they're going, they've done the track before, will, will fire in their neural synapses a memory of that place as long as they're trying to travel from where they are to that place. In other words, they are literally thinking about their goal 
and the plan that will get them from there to there. The entire process of the, like the entire time that they're traveling. When you're driving, unless you've given it over to Waze, right? What are you doing in your head? You're literally thinking, well, the next thing I need to do is turn right here, and then the next thing I need to do is turn left there. And I'm trying to get to that place. Well, that's planning. Like, because you thought, even before you got into the car, even before you got into the car, you're already thinking, you're right, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, because I've done this before, and I know where I'm going. Yeah? That's strange. I just, I, I just want to make sure that I understand correctly. Strategy, in case we're driving somewhere, would be, you know, deciding where I want to go and why. Strategy would be saying, would be saying, I've gathered all the intelligence I need to about this. I've looked up what the what the weather conditions are going to be, and I know what time it is and what traffic is like during that time, and I have a knowledge base, and I know that I want to get there by this time. So my best option would be to leave around here in order to hit that hit that. Way I want. Uh, but, but, but I'm saying it's in regret to that, for example, you are given a condition, you have a free weekend, and then you have to decide how you will spend it, maybe you want to drive to Masala. Right. That sort of thing. Right. But you, you've got all this information coming in, and you go, okay, I'm analyzing it, and I'm processing it, and I'm coming up with some sense of future. In the future, I want to be there, and I want to be there at this time. Right? right? So you're saying that strategies like uh, several plans. It could be. It could be that what strategy is, is sort of like, well, what if this happens? Well, I do that. What if this happens? I do that. What if it, that's part of strategizing is looking at possibilities. But it's also what strategy does is it gives us that sense of future self. It creates in our mind or in the mind of the company a sense of this is what we know. Here's where we want to go. And here are the broad brush strokes that we need to understand will get us from here to there. Broad brush, right? The more minutia we get into, the closer to a plan we get. And then what happens? We start thinking that that plan is set in stone. But what happens if it, something comes up from the environment that makes that plan no longer relevant? Does that mean your vision still isn't, isn't a, rea a possible reality? It depends on what it is. Right? You can't plan for every opportunity or every every risk and chance that you're going to take. It's not possible. But what you can do is you can say, if this happens, or what if this happens? And if someone's come up with a what if, if someone throws a what if at you during a strategic, a strategic planning session, what are you doing? You're going, well, we are now presenting ourselves possibilities that may result in us being thrown off course. How do we adjust? How might we adjust? if that happens. But it's how might we adjust. Why? Because I don't know if it's gonna work in the moment. How's the world change between now and then? Like, okay, you wanna get, I don't know, a new computer right now. It's really hard to get a new computer right now. Why? It has nothing to do with this. It has everything to do with supply chain, with supply chain, right? But I may have this vision of like, I'm gonna get a new computer, I do all the research, and I find out the perfect computers, and I know what I want, and I did it, and I did it, and I did it, and I do some what ifs. Well, what if that one's not available? What if that one's not available? What if that one's not available? I'm presenting myself with different options that will still meet vision. Right? But I don't yet know how I'm going to go about getting it. Do I have to go to this store? Do I have to go to that store? That's already later on in the process. And now it's no longer based on strategy. It's based on, well, how much time do I have? I mean, what kind of resources can I use? How much money am I willing to spend? You know, what kind of doctrine is involved? What does my wife think about me buying a new computer? No, I'm serious. Yeah. Right? And those are already no longer strategic questions. Those are operative questions. <laughs> those are operative questions. They're not strategic ones. Strategy might give some broad brush about the resources that they're willing to, how much are you willing to put towards marketing? $5 million, great. Now let's break that up and make sense of it, because $5 million is a lot of money to put towards marketing. What do you want to do with it? What are you doing with those resources, right? That's not, strate that's not strategic planning, that's not strategic vision anymore. Now it's taking that strategic vision and breaking it down into, well, one million is gonna go towards Facebook, and one million is gonna go towards, you know, actual splashing big photos of my workers all across the aisle on highway. Did that make sense of what I just said? 
Did it? If it didn't, no, if it didn't, tell me. No, I'm serious. No, it didn't. Okay. Do you need another way to talk about it? Or is it that I'm not making sense in terms of different plans? And I think like, you can say uh, other way to talk about it is to be there. Other way to talk about it. Another example. You just need another, another example for me to talk about it? Okay. So if you want to look at strategy, okay, let's go back for a second. If you want to look at the strategic stage in this process, right? This is about ideal outcomes and establishing vision, right? If vision is to do marketing, okay, to successfully market our new product or successfully market our company, get people to know about us and want to use whatever it is I'm selling, because that's what marketing is for, right? Marketing is about getting people interested in my product. Right? Or if you want to go to the do you want to, let's go to the military. Let's use a military example, okay? I want to conquer Iraq. They said, the politicians said to me, conquer Iraq. Okay. I now go, okay, well my overall vision is to conquer Iraq. But what does that mean? That's policy and purpose. My purpose right now is the, in the military is to follow that order and establish their vision. How do I do that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to gather as much information as I can about Iraq. Where are the centers of gravity in terms of geographic centers of gravity? What kind of forces might I come up against? What are all the different groups that might be involved in this process? Who else might be interested or might bother me along the way? How's Iran going to deal with this? What about Syria? What about Turkey? What about Jordan? Saudi Arabia? Kuwait? How are they going to be dealing with what I'm doing? Right? I establish a vision of, as if I'm the general who was just given that responsibility, of what it's going to look like at the end of the day when I say Iraq is conquered. I've done my job. I can give you a great big V, check, done. Okay? That vision will include this kind of, you know, this kind of outcome in terms of destruction, this kind of outcome in terms of in terms of the populace. This kind of outcome in terms of their ability to self-manage, right? And I give you different options that you can choose from. I can say here are different, different visions that you can choose from. Do you want me to completely destroy it? Nuclear bombs, no problem, gone. Oh, wait, you want people alive? Okay, so nuclear bombs are not an option. So let's go through all the different options that I have. But at some point I have to say, here's a vision. Here's what we're gonna work towards, right? All those options may be viable ones on some level, but eventually one of them is going to be the one that we choose to work towards, or we choose to focus on. Right? Does that make sense? So is that a better explanation? Yeah? Cool. And then what happens is operatively I get I will get certain resources that will allow me to do that. Right? I'll get the resources I've delineated, hopefully, they'll give me enough. Plus a little bit extra, because let's be honest. So it's nice to have some extra guns if you need them, right? And let's go do this thing. And then you start the operative process. Okay, here are our major objectives. We have to make sure we get Basra. We have to make sure we get, we get, you know, keep the Kuwait border safe. We don't want them to come around and, and get us from behind. We have to make sure that Iran is not going to be involved. So we're going to make sure we're doing flyovers along the Iranian border and know that there's forces that are making sure that nobody's coming across that border, even if they want to. Right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of those operations only begin to take place though after I've already been given the resources and I've started delineating you're in charge of air power over Iraq, you're in charge of land forces, you're in charge of naval forces, you're in charge of naval security. You're... All my underlings now are going to have jobs, right? And they're going to manage, one of them's going to manage this, one of them's going to manage that, one of them's going to manage this. You're in charge of LinkedIn, and you're in charge of Facebook, and you're in charge of you know, graphic design, and you're in charge of, did that make sense what I just said? Did you see the transition I just did? Did that make sense? So, you really need to know what you're doing. You have to have a sense of like what you want to be doing. And once you have that though, oh, what an amazing feeling. Like, ah, uh, it's like, okay, you have a paper you have to write. And right now you're probably sitting there going, I don't know what I'm gonna write about, right? I don't have a clue, oh my God. You're way over here. 
you're like begging for like some direction, you're not really sure, whatever, give me some policy, give me something, give me some direction about where we have to go with this. And my direction will be, I don't care what you write about, you can write about Harry Potter, I'll be happy camera, as long as you use theory. Right? And we go, okay, now we can start strategizing, now we can start doing this, now we can start actually doing the typing, and now I have to make sure I've got the theories, and I go and do the research, and I do the this, and I do the that, and I understand the this, and I do the that, and I have the people, right? Okay, so strategic thinking on some level asks the question, well, what do you know? What do you know? And what do you think? There's a big difference between those two. What do you actually know? And based on what you know, what do you believe to be true based on that information? And you go, wait a second, if I know it, then why do I believe something to be true about it? Because what you know is what will define how you intend to move forward. What you believe to be true is, given that, this is what I believe is possible, this is what I believe can be done, this is what I believe should be done in response, as the best solution, as the best response, as the best way of dealing with this. The best way, most efficient way, now best is also a verb and duration, most efficient way, fastest way, least expensive way, Right? It's up for integration. So what do you believe to be true based on that information? And then you start asking some really important questions like, well, what don't I know? What don't I know? Because what you don't know, <laughs> that's where surprise comes in. Talk about that later. You have a question? No, I just wonder what I was going to say. If you think you know that Iraq has chemical weapons, That's a great example. If you believe, right, if you think you know this and you believe to, that to be true and you believe that the only response can be your intervention in order to stop it from happening, if you believe that the only way you can stop it from happening is for you to intervene, even though it might not be true, even though it might not be true, right? But you make hypotheses. You say, well, if this, then that. Or when this, then that. Or the impact of this on that will create this. Or this action will lead to that action, which will lead to that result. Right? If we conquer Iraq, Iraq will become democratic. If we conquer Afghanistan, Afghanistan will get rid of the Taliban. <laughs> I can keep going. <laughs> Those are all hypotheses. Do you understand how these are all hypotheses? And eventually what's going to happen is you're going to try and see if that hypothesis works. In business, it's great. You can do that. But when it comes to the lives of human beings, these hypotheses are dangerous. And they're important. No, no, you're right. Like, like they're still going to do it. That's the whole thing because they don't have a choice. Right? They do have to choose to do something. And sometimes, sometimes, the if-thens and what-thens and hypothesis, you go, this is the best we've got, but we've got to do something. We have to express our will in this world in some way, even if it's not perfect. Even if it's not exactly, even if we're not sure if the outcome is going to be exactly like we want. Because if we don't, then we're letting other people write power for us. You're letting other people write power for you. Governments don't like when other people write power for them. Parents don't like when other people write parent power for them. Parents like to have like some sense of control over what their kids are experiencing and seeing and doing. And that I don't want my kid to watch porn. He's eleven. I don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's a little bit young, if you know what I mean. But there are eleven year olds who are watching porn. Okay. Does this make sense? What I just said. So this is about reading and writing power. This is fundamentally about reading writing power. It's about taking your ideas and doing your utmost to make them manifest in the world. Here's the process that, that, that you take in order to do that. And if you can figure out where you are in the process, you are one up on someone who has no clue. Why? Because you can say, I know where I need to focus right now. If I start getting thrown off by all these other things, I'm going to lose my focus. 
But if I know that right now I'm at the strategic stage, I have the idea, I know where I, I, I someone came up with some issue, and wow, I think I can solve that. I'm gonna go through this hall. Well, what do I know about it? I'm gonna research it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get all this information. And I'm gonna create this tree of knowledge, and I have got vision. Oh, I know where I'm going. Okay, if I know that, if I start getting pulled into, well, what resources do you need? And well, what 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 are the limitations that you're gonna put on your AI? And what's your this and your that? I'm not there yet. I'm not prepared to engage with that discussion. I first need to make sure that my knowledge base is set. I need to first make sure that I know where I want to go. But if you pull me along when it happens, or you pull me back with new ideas, what happens then? Strategy goes by for it and I have to start all over. Or I have to adjust and readapt and rethink and redo. And right? And that's where you can be pulled all the way down to tactics, start maneuvering, and all of a sudden find yourself back at the operative. Or even find yourself back at the strategic where you go, my knowledge base was faulty. Really faulty. Uh-oh. Let's start this process over again. Or continue, like a USA with Iraq. <laughs> wait, well, here's the thing. Even when they continue, they're like, wait, we're going to adjust strategy. Well, our vision here is completely different than we thought it was when we started. We're going to readjust. We've readjusted vision three times in Iraq. And Bush declared them having won at some point. So I'm <laughs> not sure about that one. How do you win when it comes to like this kind of war unless you killed everybody? I'm not sure. OK? So what this thinking does, what this thinking does is it tells you how do you choose how you're going to choose to act in the future. It's going to help you figure out and delineate. Here's my my choices for action. Here's the choices that I have available to me, given vision. Because if I take that choice, it doesn't fulfill vision at all. Well, I'm not going to take that choice. And if I'm forced to take that choice, my vision is now. And I just wasted two years of my life trying to figure out how to do that thing. Which is not necessarily a waste, because it depends on how, how it dies. <laughs> so far, so good? Everyone understand what I've said so far? Cool! I'll look up where I need to take a drink, and I need a little bit of my legs, so just give me one second. Okay. Yeah. Does anyone know what that is? Yes. yes, correct. Does anyone know what this this diagram represents. If you do, keep your mouth shut. That's the point of that question. If you know what this is, keep your mouth shut. Okay? Here's a story from World War II. Bombers are flying over Germany. <laughs> Coming back. And they want to figure out how to make the survival rate a little bit better so that the planes that are coming back will survive. And that the people will not all die because their planes got shot out of the sky. And the strategists, the researchers, started going at it. And they started collecting data. They collected 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 data. And this is what the data showed. The airplanes that were coming back, this is where they were all shot up. Shot up. Not shut up. Shot up. Shot up. This is where they all got hit. Boom, 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 boom. Where do you put the armor? Vision speaking, this is knowledge. Vision says, where do you put the armor? Creatively, what do you do? By armor, you mean the, the bombs? How do you reinforce your airplane so that more people come back home alive? How do you reinforce the airplane so more people come back alive? Uh, material, resources? No, that's what you would use. I'm asking you to create vision. Like yeah, but where would you put reinforcement on this plane? Like if you were to come up and draw, don't draw on this board, but if you were to come here and draw, are you putting it there? Are you going to put reinforcements there? Are you going to put it over here? Are you going to put it over there? Where are you going to reinforce? Yeah, where the most dots are, no? Anyone? Anyone else? Maybe the needle or the front. Like here? Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, so here's the story. They came up with this, and they were they were all ready to do all the places that have got dots. Oh yeah, we got to move there. We got to make sure we really really reinforce over here. And, oh wow, we got to reinforce over there. And then one of the researchers goes, "Y'all are idiots. That's not where we need to reinforce. You have what's called a cognitive bias. It's called survivorship bias. All of these planes that you used to collect your data survived. They all made it back." 
your data is faulty. The way you're reading your data is wrong. Now, if the data provides you with enough information to figure out where to reinforce your planes, where do you reinforce the planes? Wherever there isn't a dog. Why? Because the people who got hit here, and there, and here, and here, it didn't make it back. died. It didn't make it back. This is called survivorship bias. This is one of many, 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 many biases that we have when we look at data, when we strategize, when we think about what would be the best option with how we read the world, how we understand our knowledge base, and how we are going to interpret that knowledge provision. Did that make sense what I just said? Do you understand why this is very, very important? Yeah? Good. Because you're going to be looking at data at some point, and you're going to think you understand the data. And the thing that will mess you up will not be that you didn't have the data. You got the data. It will be that your interpretation of the data was biased. It was biased by something you didn't even know or didn't even see coming. I wonder if I can do that. Here, I want to show you a different bias. Let me see if I can, do I have it here? Hold on, one sec. I want to see if I have it. If not, I'm going to quickly go into you because this is really loud. Uh, okay. Um, just to list a couple of other biases while I open up YouTube for you to watch, there's survey bias and selection bias, which is like, you don't, you're choosing who you're going to ask questions of, or there's a specific limit. Volunteer bias, only people who volunteer will come. Or volunteer response bias, also known as radio, uh, radio or know it all Facebook bias. Hi. Goodbye. Goodbye. Read the instructions, okay? What do the instructions say? No, we, we don't see it. We don't see it? <gasps> okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's, that's, come on, good. Ah, oh, you can see. All right, what does it say? Count how many times the players were in white past the basketball. Shush. If you know what's going to happen, keep your mouth shut. How many times do white players pass the ball? How many passes did you count? 15, 16. Oh, 16. I didn't say the correct answer. 15, 16, something like that? Okay, now here's the question. How many of you saw the gorilla? I saw it. Now you say what gorilla, right? Hold on. I didn't see the gorilla. I saw it was like Chewbacca. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cognitive bias. Your focus on something so strongly, so such a deep focus on the thing, that a gorilla literally walks across the stage and goes, and you don't even see it. Now, if you know the gorilla's coming, it's freaking funny, right? Because you know it's going to be the, you're like, and the moment he starts laughing, you know what happens? The people around him go like, what's he laughing? Oh, there's a gorilla. But if he had been quiet, you probably wouldn't have even thought about it or seen it. Um, 
um, somebody would buy something and the cashier would duck under the table for a second and then a whole new person would yeah. appear and people would never Right, or there's one where people will like walk in between them with like a door and the person, person will switch. It's a black person to a white person. Or a person dressed in like one kind of clothing dress and something else entirely. And nobody notices because they're focused on giving instructions about something. The person asks like for directions to somewhere and they're looking at a map. All this other stuff. Why? Think about what we said uh, it was a couple of weeks ago. How many bits of information are you able to incorporate at any given point in time? 120? I mean, that's, that's, that's the known number, right? About 120 bits of information, unless you're a spectacular, you might get up to 150. A conversation takes 50 bits, right? Now, if you're focusing on something, like counting how many times the ball gets passed, you're not giving it what, about 100 bits of your, inf your, 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 your focus, and then maybe 20 bits just to keep yourself safe in the environment around you. Um, you ain't seeing the gorilla. You're not gonna notice this. Now here's, why is this a problem? Because it's not just true for us as, as individuals, companies, militaries, political institutions, NGOs have cognitive biases. And they don't know them necessarily. And it can negatively impact their strategy, how they understand the world, what their knowledge base looks like, and how it will impact their vision. Not their operative state or their tactical maneuvers. Those will definitely be impacted negatively by it. But just their vision of what this, this, the, their understanding of reality is messed up. And it's just because of these biases. To happiness, money. So, what did they want there? They would like to see their perspective on the world, more or less. There, just like in Iraq. Now, did they have a whole bunch of missions and other objectives that were part of that? Like, deal with Al Qaeda, get rid of Osama bin Laden, deal with the Taliban? Yeah. But what was their ultimate purpose? What's the ultimate purpose of them doing this? Is to keep the fight offshore. Because if it can be kept offshore, then I keep my people safe. And keep the fight there. It's not happening in New York City. That translated into, well, how do we do that? Right, if that's purpose, we as politicians don't want the fight to be on our shores. Get away from us. Keep it, you know, fight on their own turf. Now it's a question of, well, how? Why didn't they use nuclear weapons? I'm asking this as, to be very clear, that was like a very open, honest question. Why did America not simply go, um, y'all are evil, y'all are bad, you guys house bad people, you support bad ideas, <laughs> we're done. Go mm. What? Go If you kill them all, I don't think go um, wait, you're talking about like how other states would feel about this? Right. Okay. Anyone else? I'm not saying you're wrong. Any other reasons? Because uh, there's other powers that also have nukes and that would... It's, it's, it's Afghanistan. <laughs> well, yeah, but there's other interests of other nations that might get into play. And by detonating an atomic bomb, you might detonate a, an atomic war. Ah, so you're worried about, you know, if I bomb them, then they'll bomb me, and they'll bomb you. Yeah. Bomb you. Maybe. But who cares about Afghanistan? Who cares about Afghanistan? It's not like it's Pakistan. Pakistan has nuclear weapons, right? And in India, you know, they've got nuclear weapons. That's already your... Who cares about Afghanistan? It's rocks. I'm, I'm being honest. Like, yeah. I do not think they have succeeded keeping fighting off America's shorts if they did that. I'll explain why. So, I mean, you cannot kill everyone. Even with nuclear bombs, there will be people. If you send an army into Afghanistan, then all those Islamists and terrorists will go and join Talibs and try to help fight. them fight. Where the fight is. Yes, right? but if okay. you kill all the Afghans with nuclear bombs, there will be no one to help, and they will just continue Okay, so them. nuclear bombs are no longer an option. We've eliminated them strategically. It doesn't meet our vision. It doesn't keep the fight off our shores. So what do you do? Yes. Uh, well, there's also oil and economic incentives. If you destroy it, you know you destroy so your. No How much oil is there in Afghanistan? You know what? You know what? You know what Afghanistan? Billion barrels. 
How much? Six billion. Okay. Oil okay. So you're saying there's an economic reason for them to be doing this. Excellent. So you're saying it's not just you know global image. It's not just. It's not just. Hey, this might lead the fight to us. It might actually people like radicalize people even more and make them want to come to us. But hmm, let's go capitalism here for a minute. It's so worth it for us to be in charge of Afghanistan. <laughs> Put the money in my pocket. Right? Why do they want to be in charge of Iraq? How many barrels of oil are coming out of there? She checked it for us. Wait, do you understand what's happening? We're gathering intelligence. See it? We're strategizing. We're strategizing about something that already happened, but we're strategizing. I just, I just want to, to, to say something we're trying to understand. about the resources of Afghanistan. Yeah. Its main wealth is not in oil, but in rare earth minerals. Right. But, but across the board, we're talking about ec there's an economic reason. Yeah. There is a national security reason, right? There's the military reason, there's the economic reason, and then there's the social reason. What's the social reason? Americans, uh, you know, all their citizens might not feel too well about just killing everyone. Right, and more importantly, we have a moral standard about how we, some level of moral standard about how we behave in the world, and we don't use nuclear bombs unless we absolutely have to. But, you know, we have no problem taking the fight to them so that it's not being, not happening on our shores. I have no problem with their women and children have to deal with, you know, PTSD and the gunfire and everything else, but as long as it's not my kids. How is Iraq doing? Oh, uh, Iraq, okay, there's, there's a lot there. Um, so um, there's a, a balance of power in regards to Iran. Oh, no, I just want to know about the oil. The oil, they want to prevent Iran from exploiting Iraqis oil. Right. So there's oil, right. so you're saying, oil relationship. You're saying it's an oil relationship in the sense that not only do we want to make sure that Iraq can continue to produce their oil and give it to us for cheap, but also we don't want Iran to be in charge of that oil. Because if we move out, if America moves out, Iran moves in. Right? Back to Afghanistan for a minute. So we looked at all three. There's also the more there's that moral aspect. There's the norms of like, well, what's acceptable action? One of the videos you're gonna watch pretty soon actually, it when it talks about strategy, it, it's uh, Simon Sinek, he's, he actually brings in the Afghanistan aspect of it. He says, why, need, why does America have such a bad time in Afghanistan? Why did Russia have such a bad time in Afghanistan? Because while America went in with some sense of finite goals, like we want to get rid of the Taliban, we want to get rid of Al-Qaeda, we want to do these things, the Taliban were fighting what's called an infinite game. They just wanted to survive. And that's part of the reason why America was bound to lose. It's the reason why Russia lost. was because they were fi playing a finite game where somebody's supposed to win. But the modern battle battlefield, it's not played on, those, on that, that level as much anymore. Now, there are certain ones. We, 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 did we win Iraq? Well, we got Saddam Hussein and we got rid of him. So if you wanted to find that change, the elimination of Saddam Hussein's regime, and a finite game that could be played, great. But what happens afterwards? If strategy plays a finite game, if you're playing the finite game strategically, you're saying, I have a goal, once we reach that goal, game over, then whatever happens afterwards is no longer within your control. Or it's significantly less in your control. Because your vision didn't include that. Right? Today, the military in America for instance, has to not only deal with creating victory, they also have to create democracy. Did that make sense what I just said? That's a different vision entirely. Militaries are not designed to do that. That's not in the purview of what military mil what do militaries do? They blow stuff up. They build bridges and they blow them up. They build bridges and they blow them up. My grandfather would tell you this. His World War II experience. Build a bridge, blow it up the next day, build that same bridge, blow it up again. Why? You want your forces moving across it, you don't want their forces moving across it. But building a democracy? Wait, what's democratus mean? The power of people. Which people are we talking about? The Iraqi people? I'm not so sure about that. 
because the idea is that they hold to be true and that they hold to be important and that they hold to be worthwhile, fundamentally different than the, world, the ideas that Americans hold to be true and worthwhile. They are, they're different. That's a cognitive bias. People think that other people think like that. Um, yeah. Also, I think what uh, we just discussed, those two goals, you know, establishing democracy but keeping fighting off your shores, they conflict with each other. They compete with each other? Conflict. Yes, they do. Yes, because if you take the fight off of your shores, you are now enabling, you're creating a situation where the likelihood that they're going to accept your ideas goes way down. Is that what you mean? Uh, that, but also a very practical situation, uh, you know, if you want, like, you cannot have a functioning democracy in a country on which soil everywhere there is war and insurgency. Right, it's very difficult to have a democracy when if somebody wants to try and vote, they're literally putting their lives at risk. Like, like Oval, for example, you know, you, you give them full democracy and they elect Muslim Brotherhood, and you cannot have that, so you, what do you do? Right, so then in like that's Egypt. Right? So it's very fundamentally an issue. Like, okay, we want you to be democratic, but now you're choosing people we don't like. Uh, well, we didn't see that one coming. Why did you choose our candidate? Well, he doesn't speak our language. He's not talking what we believe to be true. He's not talking what we think is best for Afghanistan or Iraq or whatever. Was that a good analysis so far? Yeah, excellent. Um, does anyone have any questions about this process? Okay. So far, to be really clear, we've only touched on two major aspects of this. The first one was strategy as a part of a hierarchy. The second one was the strategic stage within the greater process of creation, creating something, whatever it is, power process, however you want to describe it. And we talked about how bias, cognitive bias, doesn't only exist in us, but like you said, you know, hey, they thought that they'd be able to get what they want, but look at reality. Reality says that if they'd done their research and they hadn't believed that what I believe is what you believe, they would have thought a little bit differently, right? Keep these things in mind, because as you move forward, you are going to have to start working on your projects, and you are going to have cognitive biases when you come to those projects, and I want you to try and come with as clean a slate as you can, okay? This is gonna be really important when you start to strategize. Next week, we're gonna start talking about the project, because this is a project which starts next week, and it goes until the end of the year. And you work as groups, and there's a whole lot of stuff to do. So we're going to talk about that next week. But I want you to, before we even get into that, whatever else you come with, try and keep your mind as open to the fact that you might not be understanding what it is that you want to do or what you're being told by other people who are doing research. Okay? Cool. Questions? Thoughts? Statements? Anything? 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 See you all later.